Welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies, to dive headfirst into some nostalgia, or just get a little creative. So every month, we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or send an email to ScreenRefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three are or to suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dean and Nick. Hello there. Yo, Joe! <laughs> Today we're taking a look at comedies that have somehow broken through our cold, dead hearts and made us laugh, so settle in for some Rule of Thirds. Oh, comedies? I chose my favorite G.I. Joe movies. <laughs> Shit. I, I mean, Star I Wars think... quotes. <laughs> I picked my top three favorite episodes that we've done of this show. Oh, man. Every podcast I've been on is, as always, and forever will be just, and this is Nick. Hello there. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Ahoy, it's, hoy. It's totally okay. And mine will change. It will never be the same. It's, it's a, it's a uh, duality. At the end of your life, we'll do a super cut of all of your intros on every episode. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I'm not going to, but... Oh. Top of the order. Comedies. There was a movie that's actually as recent as last year, but somehow makes my list of my Mm. my top three here. Is a horror comedy called Scare Package. Cold opener. You only have a few minutes to put all the pieces in place. Hi, I'm hunting a creature. Well, a man. Maybe you've seen him? How are we gonna fix this? I'd like to rent a wood chipper. We are in a horror movie! Nobody? Horror. Horror movie. It's a very new addition as it popped up on Shudder last year, uh, the horror streaming service from, I think, AMC. And I found myself laughing much more than I was expecting for like a random pop-up streaming uh, horror comedy. It's this anthology movie with a framing story about a dude named Rad Chad who owns a video store. And it's him dealing with like an annoying customer who wants to work there and training his new hire at the video store. And as he's going through like the training and all of that... They end up incorporating five separate stories in addition to an opener to the whole thing and the framing story itself. As far as the anthology, every story is done by a different team. So if one doesn't click with you, it's possible the next one might. For me, it's kind of quickly become a movie I just throw on in the background while I'm doing other things because it still makes me laugh and just has like a fun energy to it. Just because it's... There's a lot of gore. There's a lot of like violence. There's a lot of stuff, but none of it is ever malicious or none of it is ever like you can still just turn it on and have fun it's like yeah a ton of people die in another movie i might be like oh i'm disappointed that's my favorite character in this it's like yeah it's fun like it's it's still a laugh so over time like even the segments that i originally wasn't sold on have grown on me uh the more i watch it just because the entire movie is just like all different horror tropes and references and all these different things that some of them are a little kind of very obvious or some of them are a little kind of uh over the top but there's a, also a bunch of like little sly ones here and there so on occasion like yeah it might be hokey um but i think at the the end of the day the the whole thing is fun as a group but if anybody is interested to check it out definitely see the segments one time in the woods and horror hypothesis what's the title of it scare package i'll have to add it to the list and this came out oh yeah in 2019 I mean, if you can handle the gore, I think you would laugh at it, Dean. Joe, why does Joe Bob? Why is Joe Bob Briggs? Why do I know who he is? Was he a host of a? Uh, do you remember Monster Vision on TNT? Yes, yes. I was going to say he was a host of something. Yep, yep. That yep. makes he was a sense. host of Dustin Monster Rhodes. Vision. I think he was the host on. There's a wrestler in the cast list too. I was just like, oh, his name's Dust Dustin Rhodes. I don't know what he plays. I have no idea. The only other person I know from that movie, other than, uh, well, you gave away the fun cameo of Joe Bob. Oh, the only other, well, um, they listed him second in the... <laughs> <laughs> the only other person I know is Chase Williamson, who played in John Dies at the End. 
Uh, I forgot that and was played in that. Yep. But yeah, he he's a blast in this one. He's funny. He plays the the stoner in one of the the move or like one of the segments. So if you can handle the gore, it is definitely worth watching. And there's a lot of fun practical effects throughout the movie. So it's something that it's fun enough that I'm definitely going to keep an eye out to see any of the additional work that any of the groups do from here on out. Just because it, if they can make me laugh consistently, like after watching it a couple times for any of these segments for 15 minutes, I'm sure that they're going to end up making me laugh with whatever else they do next. Now I got to put it on my list. Oh, I see du- Dustin Rhodes. He's a wrestler. He's in the segment Horror Hypothesis Devil's Lake Impaler. That's what he plays. Oh. I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, that dude's Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. I just noticed his name and was like, I know this person. Have you seen, um, I didn't even know this was a movie, uh, Willy's Wonderland? Did you watch that? I, I actually just watched that last you week. You just watched it? What did you think of that? I have, I no, I have no concept of it. I just saw that it existed it and is, that Nicolas Cage is in it. It is weird. Um, I enjoyed it. I don't know if I would have enjoyed it if it didn't have Nicolas Cage. Because overall, like, the entire thing is essentially just Nicolas Cage ends up becoming the janitor at, like, a Chuck E. Cheese scenario. And it turns into, like, Five Nights at Freddy's. That's what that is? I heard that <laughs> okay. came out. <laughs> I, I it, it came up in the horror comedy search. So that's why I brought it up. Yeah. So Nicolas Cage is great in it. The rest of the overall story is like, yeah, it's not bad, but I feel like if you took Nicolas Cage out of it, I don't know if the whole thing would have held up for me. Um, Because he's the one that kind of brings that pizzazz to that movie. But yeah, it's it's fun. Uh, Definitely check it out. I think it's on Hulu, um, that one, yeah. Yeah, that's like, I don't know, just a couple months old, I think, as far as the release. But anyway, Scare Package... Scare package. What do you mean what's happening in the movie? Just watch the movie. I'm writing these down. I get it. It's clever that they do it like that. The opening segment is a little hokey. Um, but it's it's uh, good natured and fun. But it, it is definitely a little hokey. And then as time goes on, like it's it really sets it. Once you get to the first full segment, One Time in the Woods... Like that, it's hilarious. <laughs> if you don't think it's hilarious, uh, call me and tell me I'm wrong. Okay, I, maybe I will. I'll have to watch it without Laura because even though it's funny, quote unquote, she can't handle the. Oh the blood. yeah, 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 no. the blood. Oh, I wouldn't yeah. ask her to well, watch. I was it. gonna say if she had just an infectious laugh, so that you might not be laughing, but because she is, you'll start laughing, and that defeats the whole. <laughs> call me if you don't laugh. Like, <laughs> Okay, so that's 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 scare package, uh, segue music, and and then over to the next person. No, this uh, this podcast is now officially canceled due to a lack of hustle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, deal with it. Now that's that's a segue. <laughs> that's my first pick is uh, heavyweights from February nice. nineteen ninety five. From the everyday world, there is a place. A place where big... Congratulations, Mr. Sims. You are the fattest boy in camp. (laughs) ...is beautiful. Chipmunks, download! And thin isn't it. This is definitely not sanitary. For Jerry and his friends, it was a dream come true. Until the new owner... That is out of here, mister! Oh, no. Turned it into a nightmare. Lunch has been canceled today due to lack of hustle. Now, after six... This was like one of the... I didn't even realize like Disney would make movies like this where it's just like a straight up movie. Like, oh, this is cool. And then watching it, like, I didn't realize it until later on that it actually was Disney. I'm like, this is... Seems to be kind of outside their kind of spectrum. And then, well... Let me rewind. So the movie. Do you mean follows... like you thought like they only made animated like yeah features? Is that what you're saying? Okay. 
Yeah. Because, like, some stuff, like, they produce under a different... I think Touchstone is also a Disney entity, if I'm not mistaken. I see. You know? Yeah, I think it might be Touchstone. And um, knowing now, like, oh, you know, it's a Disney flick. They just... It's too dark, so they don't want to put their name on it. But thinking back, I can't think of that many uh, kid movies that Disney made that wasn't animated. Because this was during their prime of, you know, like, their renaissance period. But, um... Heavyweights is about a boy named Jerry. Um, he's sent to camp for plus size kids, and he was shown like this video of like Camp Hope. It's supposed to be this really super fun place for you know kids to just you know get together, have fun, just like typical summer kid kind of stuff. Um, he goes by himself. He eventually meets some of his fellow campers on the way there. He finally gets there, and he's expecting it to be, like, this grandeur kind of place of, like, oh, this is going to be amazing, just to find out that the owners actually sold it to some guy, and that some guy happens to be Tony Perkins, played by Ben Stiller. <laughs> and he actually wants to turn this, <sighs> you know, plus-size camp into a fitness camp instead. And the kids pretty much start a rebellion against him. And uh, <laughs> the antics through the whole movie are pretty funny. And honestly, I think this is also one of Ben Stiller's best movies. Even though he's not front and center as like the main character, he plays the antagonist through the movie. Super fun to watch. I still enjoy yeah. it. And was this a young Keenan Thompson in it, this one it too? It was. That actually has an all-star cast. And especially now looking back and realizing that this was also... I mean, it was directed by Stephen Brill. But Judd Apatow is listed as a producer and writer in the credits. Oh, well, that must have been early. Yep. So when you look through the cast list and you see some of the like the tertiary characters in the supporting cast, like, oh shit, I recognized you. Like, you're in a lot of the Adam Sandler stuff. You're in some of the Judd Apatow stuff. And as a kid's movie, you don't realize, like, this kind of fits in with all the rest of this stuff that he's done. It's just there's no, you know, yeah. stoner jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Keenan had been, I think, on SNL for three years by the time this movie came out. <laughs> You're saying he's been there for that long? He's been carrying <laughs> yes. SNL ever Yes. Since? <laughs> it warmed my heart to see that Keenan Thompson made it to SNL. Like, at least, like, one of my favorite childhood actors actually making a thing for himself. Like, oh shit, he made it to SNL. Like, that's great. Because I look at it as, like, a segue into doing other stuff because thinking of like Will Ferrell, you know, um, Dan Aykroyd and all the, like the classic crew, Eddie Mur Eddie Murphy was in SNL, right? Or was he in one of the different ones? He was early. Yeah. He was, yeah. yeah. You know, just like the amount of stuff that they've done, I always felt like SNL was like, oh shit, they're on it now. Like that means that we're going to see even more great things from him. Um, you know, Steve, uh, Steve Hader, is it? Bill, Bill Hader. Hader. That's it. Yeah. You know, he's another big guy that does a ton of work, like, all with um, SNL roots. So I'm hoping that uh, still something comes along. But yeah, he's, uh, yeah. he's um, he was in it. Which I think he might be, I want to see he's producing or he's doing something for, like, a reboot of all that now. But I agree, it's like, Keenan's been in showbiz and funny since he was a kid, so... It's only natural for him to kind of continue doing big things over time. I'm just surprised that he hasn't broken out too much of TV. Good Burger is was almost on my list tonight. Like, <laughs> he carried my childhood. <laughs> if you like Kenan and Kel, um, you should check out the show Southside. Um, because there is an episode with Kel Mitchell as a cameo, and he is... Right back to being as funny <laughs> as I remember from uh, back in the day. Good times. I know that he he reply he reprised himself as uh, Ed from Good Burger. I think Jimmy and Fallon. They like recreated the whole set. They managed to get Keenan Thompson on there. <laughs> I'll have to Google it. So yeah, the um. I love good physical comedy, and Heavyweight did have a lot of good physical comedy. I was rewatching the trailer just to refresh my memory, and it's a shot. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's when he's first introduced, but what's his name? Perkins, Tony Perkins. Um, he's he's like hand springing through the mess hall, 
um and he just like eats shit and just like <laughs> goes head first into the wall it's just a really well done physical bit but i know i remember this movie having a lot of good physical comedy Ben Stiller and just jacked, just dude. Ben Stiller being such an asshole, like, yeah. like a good asshole, is, is entertaining. I've never seen. I mean, I'm assuming it's probably like his. Um, was it like the orderly role in Happy Gilmore? Yeah, my fingers are your fingers. Probably are, based well, on this because you pulled landscaping <laughs> duty. <laughs> yeah, when I I'll, started, I'll have to check the movie out. I've only ever seen like. The trailer, and then just I think <laughs> Nick quoting, "It's been canceled due to lack of hustle." <laughs> I think I saw this. I don't think I was a kid when I saw this. It was later in life. Like I know it was right around that peak time You're where I sh- probably should have seen it, but I was I was a bad. My balls had dropped, and I was thinking about <laughs> girls. I remember watching it a ton during summertime and i when i looked up when the movie came out it was february so i was surprised so i think maybe i don't know if it had a theatrical release or what but i know i didn't see it there and it might have been through a free disney preview weekend but um i recorded it and that's how i managed to watch it for as long as i did and if i didn't record it it just they played it like every single day while we had disney channel because that wasn't a channel that we got often like having Disney seem to be more rare than having like HBO because that was also one of the premium TV channels that one could possibly get. So we never had it often. This movie's got uh, Goldberg in it too. It was like, I think he was in Mighty Ducks and this, and I think that was like his big uh, childhood movies. Like the wrestler Goldberg or like Adam Goldberg? <laughs> Bill Goldberg. Not <laughs> not Adam Goldberg, not Bill Goldberg, but the character Goldberg from the Mighty Ducks. Oh yeah, the goalie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. His name's not coming to mind. I immediately assumed you meant the wrestler Goldberg. <laughs> I I did. Too. Bill Goldberg. I think that that um that actor went through a lot of shit recently. He did. I actually saw a picture of him not. Not too long ago, and he looked night and day better than how he's been doing, and hopefully that's continued for him. Yeah. Yeah. That's, remember- that's a shame to see you like that, but... Yeah, the, the kid that plays Jerry, the lead in this movie, like, he long-bottomed big time, because when I looked him up, just to see, like, oh, I wonder what some of, like, the principal cast is doing. I already know what Ben Stiller's doing, you know, um, Kenan Thompson and shit. And when I looked up Jerry, I'm like, holy shit, like... <laughs> Complete, complete long bottom. Didn't expect it. Wait, what's long bottom? Neville long bottom. Yeah, it's uh the glow up. Yeah. Oh, oh, he became sexy. Yes. <laughs> I got you. I yeah. wasn't seeing that as a verb. I was like, rock bottom, long bottom. Like, what happened? Did he did he fall and fall from another grace? another example? <laughs> I got you now. <laughs> long bottoming is um hiccup from. How, um, how to Train Your Dragon. Because you get, like, Neville Longbottom in the first one, and by the time you get to the third one, it's like, this is dealing with a man now. <laughs> he didn't get buff and sexy, though. He just, he just, he, he wised up. A little, a little Also, buff. there's think... some heavy Rule 34 <laughs> in that. Also, in How Wait, to Train what? Your Dragon, I feel like that was, <laughs> that was a series that got very dark over time. Like, I still enjoyed it, but it's like he... What was it? He loses a leg or something like that. That was in the first one, yeah. That was I the first movie, yeah. When there's that actual, the like, so many movies now, like, you know nothing's gonna happen to the main character. There is no sense of peril, because I know these, all, all these people are gonna live. That's why I want to go into every Disney Pixar movie with the Texas Chainsaw slogan, who will survive and what will be left of them. <laughs> Toy Story 3, <laughs> holy shit, like, I surpri- I'm surprised they went with that, uh, the ending that they tried to do. Like all the toys admitting Whoa. that they're about to die, like that is the most adult oh, thing yeah. I've ever seen in a child movie. Holy shit! Yeah, they're like, them. we're all gonna die together, and like this is our fate. <laughs> hold it. And yeah. then they all hold hands and they start looking at each other, looking down at the pit. Like holy fuck! That movie <laughs> hit me hard. Yeah, every every well, probably most now now grown men would be crying by the end of that movie. I think since the 
we started recording tonight, we've discussed how I can't make it through uh, the song Kodachrome. Um, I can't listen to the song Father and Son when they played at the end of Guardians 2. And I can't uh, make it through Toy, Thor- or Toy-, Toy Story 3. Uh, Toy Story 3. Kodachrome, Kodachrome came up in our preamble, so the listeners don't know about that. <laughs> Our preamble should have that just came been up. fully recorded. That was its own many. Yeah, we should have itself. It was. It was a lot of a lot of time. Ah, you right? guys should have been there. We we talked about uh, <laughs> the hobbies of uh, figure and comic and toy collecting, uh, speculation on price projections, the early rise of Vin Diesel's acting career <laughs> as a street yep. shark, uh, street salesman. He's the leader of the street sharks. He's a great warrior. He's got the feel, real shark skin. And he's, his special power is the right hand roundhouse punch. He sends a competition to a watery grave. Boom! Um, and uh, things that make me cry. <laughs> All right, another offshoot. We got rule of thirds, and now we'll have to have a, some other segment about everything just just an anything podcast we just talk for two hours <clears throat> the theory of everything yeah the theory. <laughs> that's what it'll be called we just talk for two hours <laughs> and hopefully it's interesting so heavyweights I, I oh yeah before we move on i was gonna ask like how um does that end does like does uh ben stiller get his or does he like come around to like being a nice guy or is he just like he just gets he, he just gets his come up and I don't remember. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it to you. Don't they? You want to spoil? Don't they bury it? him alive at the end? <laughs> well, they do tie him up. They lock him in the thing. And the kids make a pact that if he ever returns thirty years later, they'd come back. <laughs> There's some like stupid. I don't remember. I haven't. I didn't rewatch it for this, so forgive me. I mean, I remember the movie. I just. I actually don't remember how he gets busted, but I feel like something happens where like a legal loophole and like he. Tax evasion or some stupid shit. I was going to say tax evasion like Capone. Yeah. It's how they get them <laughs> Something all. stupid and they come in and they realize like, oh, you're a sham. Mm-hmm. We're going to arrest you. and Or he's broke. And take, he wasn't take able your to like, officially buy it. I don't remember. You don't have to worry about the CIA, the FBI, the DEA. The IRS always gets its man. I'm a terrible podcaster. I don't have my info. <laughs> and it's my movie. <laughs> just research it when you edit this episode and, just, and then just insert it i might yeah so um yeah he ended up doing this and this is how he got arrested hey this is nick editing the episode i did end up refreshing my memory of the ending but i'm not gonna spoil it the movie's worth watching go watch it i actually had a tough time selecting what i'm calling my third favorite which is really it's drum roll The year was 1994, and this particular comedic actor had a hell of a year, starring in Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, and this selection of my third movie, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Never heard of it. The Miami Dolphins are missing their mascot, and only one man can track him down. Ace Ventura, pet detective. I don't do humans. Whether he's under fire, undercover. I'm looking for Ray Finkel and a clean pair of shorts. No. All the comedies on my list are very unknown, (laughs) obscure comedies. Ace Ventura. Isn't it just some dolphin documentary? (laughs) I should be afraid of this movie because it deals... Well, he's not in the ocean, but... Oh, there is a... Yeah, there's a shark in this movie. You know, yeah. You know, this this could be... <laughs> There's a shark. This is it. <laughs> this is what caused it. No, I saw Jaws before this, but... um, I did that part... I don't remember being particularly like scared of that part in Ace Ventura where he's finds the tank with the great white in it. Well, it is pretty terrifying. Yeah. It is... I mean, they, they make it out to be directly a Jaws kind of little parody there. Just like, that they, that's the feeling they give you. Um... It's a pretty good parody. Um, I wonder how they did that shark. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, that 1994. I'm not sure which came out first of the three of Mask. 
uh, Dumb and Dumber. And I think they were all the same weekend. <laughs> well, that would have been insane. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing Jim Carrey. <laughs> As Jim Carrey in Jim Carrey. Yeah. The Jim Carrey story. I don't know how long a break there was between Once Bitten and then these. I think quite a bit, because I think Once Bitten was like 80s. Yeah, that was like, it must have been yeah, like 89 or 90 or something. It's weird for him to get like a leading role in that, and then it's like, but he didn't become the superstar for years later. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. As far as like feature films, like I don't know what kind of reception that had. I remember watching that on Comedy Central like a long time ago. Yeah, I only saw the TV version. I don't know if it's like a a lot was edited out or not. But uh, there was a decent amount, if I recall. There's some jokes and things like that that weren't even really jokes <laughs> back when it was made. <laughs> It was like, mm, that's a bit rough. But yeah, it was 1985. When, when I saw it in theaters, there were even jokes then. Like, I that went over my head. But why is the theater laughing so hard? Like, at the end of the movie, I thought Einhorn shit himself. And they were yeah. just close up on just the dookie. I'm like, oh, okay. That was going to be one of my points about this. Was like, I remember loving it as a kid. And then... As I got older, like, rewatching it, there's like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff. Obviously, the movie's not for children, but... <laughs> Considering they made a cartoon show <laughs> toys. They, they really... realized kids were... They realized kids loved it. Because he is a cartoon character, but he's in a PG... A very PG-13 world. Like, I think they straddle the line. You know, in all three of his early 90s hits, they made cartoons for, despite That's how none, true. none of them That's are a... meant for kids. That's a great point. Like, the mask can kind of be, but, I mean, it's got adult themes. Like, it's, there's a lot of violence in it. I mean, hell, even yeah. the original property of the mask is really fucking violent. Ace Ventura came out February 4th. It was a February release, which... Oh, a Valentine's <laughs> Day treat. By the time of blockbusters, uh, like, movie blockbusters, like, that's... I don't know how the climate was in the early, mid-90s, but, like, the February, it's, like, not a... It's, like, a not a dumping ground, per se, but it's not... When you release what you think is going to be your strong movies, your tent poles, um, but obviously it was a surprise. It was a breakout hit, and it uh, pretty much made Jim Carrey a movie star. That um, Dumb and Dumber must have was like starting to film around that time because that came out in De- December sixth of that year of ninety four. The Mask was the was the summer movie that was July twenty eighth. So they were putting a lot on that. It's amusing to me that Jeff Daniels, as a kid, that's where I knew him from, <laughs> only to find out that he's not a comedic actor. No, yeah, that was like a Leslie Nielsen yeah. moment for him. So it was really interesting seeing all of his other stuff and being like super serious, and he's not funny, and I'm expecting, you know, Harry the whole time. And Skis, huh? That's right. Great. The yours? Uh-huh. Both of them? Yeah. <sighs> cool. <laughs> um, that movie never clicked with me. Oh man, that's yeah. I it, it maybe not the mask, but a Dumb and Dumber could have been the third, my third choice on here. Probably bolstered by the fact that it had the Mortal Kombat trailer on the VHS, which totally took me by surprise at the time. But um. I feel February 1994 was eclipsed by Disney's blank check. <laughs> Probably for a lot of people our age at the time, yeah. Ace Ventura. Pet detective. I thought you'd never ask. All righty then. Directed by Tom Shadyak. Um, he also wrote it from a story from someone else. He did a lot of, he had a, a string of successful, comedy like 90s comedies uh the, the night professor came after this which he wrote yeah that was good liar i'm sorry i mean saying successful not necessarily that you like it um liar <laughs> liar patch adams and bruce almighty <laughs> <laughs> okay i appreciated all the other ones <laughs> i rewatched the night um, professor it's actually good the first one I've heard of dreadlocks, but shit locks. Um. <laughs> I, I didn't like the original either. Like, I didn't like it when Jerry Lewis did it, and I didn't really like I liked Eddie Murphy. I just didn't really like the Nutty but Professor bit. Sh- what was his name? Mm-hmm. Sherman? Sherman. Um, spandex. Oh, spandex. I don't know. I mean, I can't say if the movie's 
<laughs> I don't remember it as like I'm, I liked it as a kid. I think I just yeah I haven't watched that in a long time. That's definitely part of the zeitgeist because I remember like yeah. all of the lines from that whole movie was like the favorite thing everyone's done. I'm about to get my colon cleaned. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's a little Hercules. Show me muscle again. Oh, Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. Essentially, Hercules. just all the scenes that Jack Black makes fun of in Tropic Thunder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the same director who did all those. Did uh, I think this was his breakout directing success, I guess. Um, but anyway, Jim Carrey is just the front and center of this movie, and I, as a kid, just like he was my com like he was like the icon. Like it was like I would watch anything with him in it i was watching a living color probably wasn't supposed to at the time um fire marshal bill loved him um but you know the movie's about the dolphin that gets stolen because of a disgruntled uh, former player played by sean young um which i feel like she has a weird history in hollywood that i don't really know about uh yeah because i think with sean young also in um Blade Runner? Blade Runner. Yep. Yeah. Um, so a tangent, or uh, side note, she was the year before this in a movie called Fatal Instinct, which I love as well because that's a, it was a airplane style send up of like body heat and fatal attraction and all those. I was just about to say, like, crime, in my head, love I was like, crime I know, movies. I was like, I know Basic Instinct, but I know Fatal <laughs> Attraction, but I've never heard of Fatal Instinct. Yeah, it sends so, up both of those movies that as like its mm, base, like parody, and then it's just like one of those parody movies like top secret all those movies oh god it was it was hard when i started to look oh. at like these directors and people's like other movies i'm like oh all these movies could be on this list like, I, so yeah now that you now that you remind me about um top secret now i'm disappointed because i'm like oh wait a second top secret hot shots i forgot about yeah. all of these yeah yeah the spoof movies are some of my hot shots, favorite part kinds dude. of comedy right dude I st- <laughs> Hot Shots Part 2. Another tangent. I w- always crack up in the opening scene when he's fighting the guy and he's like <laughs> breaking the stuff and he's like dipping his hands in the glass or whatever and then he dips his hands in caramel and yeah. then it's like dipping it in M&M's Candy. and Cookie Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Um, Topper. Uh, yeah. Ace Ventura. Like, I... I would this is I would watch this movie and rewind the VHS and watch like literally the entire thing again. Like I would watch it back to back. Maybe even maybe not three times, I don't really remember. This was a childhood favorite. I would act it out. Like I would do the movie front to back. And my sister just seemed to enjoy it. And then I would get to the parts that I didn't understand that were adult and I would say them and they were like, No, no, no. Like I would bend <laughs> over and like start Singing out of my ass. <laughs> I'm like, asshole, you And they're like, no, hey. Uh. <laughs> I'm like, what? I didn't know he was saying asshole. I didn't know that. I never understood the joke in the beginning with, um, he finds the dog, he returns it to the girl, and then he's just, like, kind of <laughs> holding the ceiling, yeah. dancing for a second. Never understood it. We're real friendly around here. Whoa. My little childhood mind. <laughs> <laughs> Also, come to think of it, now that you meant, so his partner was Tone Loke. Yes. Yep. Surf Ninja's which, fame. So that means yeah. full. Circle. So that means Tone Loke did Surf Ninjas the year before, and then this year he yep. did Ace Ventura, and the same month he did Blank Check. He yep. yeah well, how yeah he was like Ice Cube before so I, Ice Cube. I mentioned it in the I mentioned it in the Surf Ninjas episode. He. He worked in L.A., <laughs> got sick of all of the fucking ninjas, moved to Miami to try to get away from all of that. Then he ended up getting stuck with Ace. And then after solving the um, Snowflake's disappearing case, that's when he decided to just go rogue. He breaks bad. And then he moved. And then he breaks bad. I ain't had a vacation in 17 months, amongst other things. And I'm in some deep need of some serious laughs. You know what I'm saying? I thought he's in deep cover. Oh, oh, we don't know. I guess we'll have to. We'll know if once we do our blank check episode. Now, I now I want to watch it. Can see, can Disney do a like a from the other perspective movie like they did with Cruella, 
of Tone Loke, <laughs> deep cover, working for the, the enemy. Or he in shows Blank up Jack. in the next 21 Jump Street movie. Yeah. <laughs> that would work. Are they making? I other? enjoyed those movies. Talking comedy, I enjoyed them more than I thought I would. Like those, I think were funnier than I they had too. a right to be. I was, I was a little disappointed when they started to do like that parody thing at the end, and they were showing all the different Twenty One Jump Street movies <laughs> yeah. they were making. Because I took it as like, oh shit, this is the last one. Because you wouldn't make that kind of joke if you have a third one. Planned. Yeah. Yeah, I'd watch another one of those. Um, I mean, we've all seen. Ace Ventura, not too much to say too much about. I guess maybe the, you know, this might come under a little bit of, like, it's a product of its time and, like, uh, you know, socially in, like, gender roles. Or I don't know how, I, don't know how I would say that. Um, like, like, people transitioning or transgender. Like, there's probably a lot of jokes that maybe are in poor taste in this movie at, today, but that aside, like, it's still a pretty good comedy to watch. you mean that the writers of ace ventura pet detective didn't approach that topic uh no with no <laughs> proper information and a, a gentle touch no they know they did not but i guess that goes probably a lot of topics that have changed today it's like that was i want to say it's accepted but it's like it's like that's just how like people weren't you know considering considering that just like homosexual kind of culture like it was like a taboo thing and then now it's just become very like yeah whatever which is good but at the time yeah. you know we get movies like that <laughs> the easiest way to tell if we've grown as a culture is to watch things we used to laugh at and be like "Ooh, that's not funny anymore. <laughs> yeah even oh and bill and ted it's like they say the f word not fuck but the other one you're like ah damn you're like shit yeah. they said it but you know those people aren't in their hearts aren't like you know jerks and assholes just like that was okay to say that word back then yeah so you just kind of look it, past it, it was thrown that. liberally around throughout yeah. like the 80s movies yeah yeah like some of the ones i loved that it's just like oh kids talking and they're dropping it and i'm like really yep it's like ooh, everything else <laughs> nailed it aside from that part of it uh ace venture i think is still really rewatchable and very funny today to me still i remember rubber face carry a I remember not seeing it for years, as I mentioned in the previous episode, and everybody always used to talk about it. And then finally, when I was working for Blockbuster and it was like late one night, everybody, it was kind of a, a slow night. So I just, we turned it on the uh, the TVs there just so I can watch it while I'm stocking stuff. And I enjoyed it. And then I came back later and I set up like the AB repeat of a specific scene and it was the put me in the game coach, I'm ready to play, and then he smashes his face into the table. <laughs> and it was just like over and over of him hitting his face into the chair. Uh, this is one of our therapy rooms. And uh, we do arts and crafts out here in the courtyard. And this is the storage room. And down the hallway here, we have another... <laughs> uh, I guess so, speak, um, speaking of that scene and me collecting toys, the NECA, N-E-C-A, they <laughs> um, they put out an eight-inch clothed figure of regular Ace Ventura in his like striped pants and Hawaiian shirt. But then they also just released the him at Shady Acres' uh, mental facility in his tutu. Um, it's entertaining. I don't have those. Like I have, a, I have an affinity for that movie, but I have no desire to own the figure. But it's still funny that they made it in any case. It's even got his like that deranged look on <laughs> <Yeah>. his face. <laughs> Just I'm ready to go in, I coach. Just that. give me a chance. <laughs> Half um, time. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be in a fly on the wall on like I guess any of these movies, The Mask, Dumb and Dumber, Ace Ventura, just to see like. Yes, there's there's lines written on the page, but like, how much are they like? Okay, Jim, go, like, do your thing, action. <laughs> like, he just yeah. Any movie he's in, I'm honestly amazed they even got a film recorded because <laughs> I feel they would waste all their film by like day two because <laughs> just he wouldn't stop. <laughs> and it's just too precious not to like. You got to keep recording him, man. <laughs> it's not on the page, but we still need Classic. it. 
Plastic Ace. So I guess that brings us back around to me with number two. I don't know where you gentlemen were in September of 1944, but number two on my list is based on a 1941 play called Arsenic and Old Lace. In it, there's a man. Now listen to this. Now he knows he's in the house with murderers, mm -hmm. so he ought to know he's in danger. He's even been warned to get out of the house. And does he go? Yes. No, he doesn't. He stays. Huh. This fellow doesn't even have sense enough to be scared no. or to be on his guard. No, no. The murderer even invites him to sit down. And what do you think he does? Oh, I don't know. He sits down. Isn't that one of He deliberately pulls up a chair <laughs> like that and he sits down in it. Isn't that great? <laughs> So there he is, all waiting to be trussed up and gagged. <laughs> what do you think they used to truss him up with? Oh, what? The curtain cord. Curtain <laughs> cord? <laughs> but didn't he see him get it? See him get it? No, the silly chump sits down with his back toward the murderer. All he has to do is look around, but does he? No. Yeah. Look, don't you see Brother Heidelberg in a play, or even in a movie for that matter, a fellow never sees or hears anything. Oh, no, yeah. that's right. Uh, but, but what does he do? What does he do? Well, the big chump sits there. This fellow is supposed to be bright. He sits there. Now, get a load of this. Look. <laughs> look at the attitude. <laughs> Large as life. He sits there waiting to be tied up and gagged. <laughs> a big dog. <laughs> Directed by Frank Capra. That did a just a string of classic movies uh, that you guys probably know some of them, like... It's a Wonderful Life, Meet John Doe, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, It Happened One Night, uh, and Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, which was re eventually remade into Mr. Deeds with Adam Sandler. So he had just like kind of hit after hit after hit during that time. All of his movies were known as, uh, reviewers would call it Capricorn because they said it was very kind of uh, corny at the time uh, while still being I popular. I resent that. <laughs> what? As a Capricorn, that is <laughs> using it as a cool <laughs> as a as a derogatory. You called it that. I'm like, wait, I'm waiting for it. Like, where's where's the negative? <laughs> oh yeah, it's. I mean, it's because Capra corn. Um, yeah, I get that. But yeah, I, I, I yeah. yeah 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 you get it you get it ice. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the the movie itself we follow Mortimer Brewster who is Cary Grant. Directly following him trying to get a marriage license in secret, secret with his new wife because he's trying to do it in secret because he's like a well-known writer and a well-known bachelor. Uh, he wrote books on kind of like staying single kind of deal. So it's the equivalent of like when George Clooney finally got uh, married kind of thing. So before they escape for their honeymoon, he stops at his aunt's house in I think it's like Brooklyn. Um, and it's I think... I think it's Halloween. Yeah, it's Halloween night on Brooklyn, and they live like right next to the cemetery. So he decides to check in and pick up some things, and then kind of hijinks ensue because while he's visiting uh, and getting his stuff, he ends up checking in their window seat looking for something and finds a dead body in the window seat, <laughs> and he thinks it's his cousin who's uh, thinks he's Teddy Roosevelt. The cousin is constantly like plays his bugle and charges up the stairs and everything. So he thinks that the cousins finally completely snapped and killed somebody. And then he's trying to kind of figure out like, what do we do with this? If it was my cousin, I need to take care of him. So I need to have him committed like immediately. I need to get him into a, a good home. Uh, so he's trying to reach out to like this happy Dale sanitarium. He's trying to like get all the paperwork done before he goes on his honeymoon. And as this is going on, like his, Aunts are poisoning old men and burying them down in the basement, uh, telling the uh, cousin that it's a yellow fever victim, so he needs to go down to Panama and dig another canal. So he's burying all of the bodies down there. Uh -huh. So it's it's just a wacky movie. His uh, old like his brother that turned into a criminal that they say was like looked like Boris Car or Karloff. They ended up. Uh, he comes home with Peter Laurie, who, and they're on the run from like some other murders that they did. So they're trying to hide the body of the guy they just killed in the aunt's house, and they end up finding the other bodies. So it's like this weird stalemate of you can't call the cops because I'll call the cops on you because all of us have a body in this house at this point. <laughs> so it, it's it's fun. It, it's all over the place, but the the stage play 
the character of the brother was played by Boris Karloff, who had an investment in the theater uh, production for it. So when they did the movie, Raymond Massey took over for him, but they kept all the stuff discussing like that he looks like Boris Karloff because he had like plastic surgery, but the doctor was drunk. So he has like all these scars and kind of uh, features on him. So I remember my parents showing me this as a young child and it just became one of those movies that cemented into my brain to the point where I remember tracking down and listening to the radio productions that they did of the show because I was like this child out of time who grew up loving 40s radio shows. So at this point, it's I've seen this movie dozens of times. I've heard this movie in a half hour production. I've seen this or heard this movie in an hour production. Um, and every single time it's it's a blast. Come into it with a grain of salt just for the fact that if you're not a fan of like classic films that Yes, it's a little kind of hokey if you were to compare it to current, um, but it's, I still laugh at it. It's still great. I mean, even if you're, uh, even if you like uh, scoff, not scoff's not the right word because they're classics, but like if you like, oh, black and white, it's from the 50s or 40s, sorry, like mm -hmm. you, you can't escape Cary Grant's charm. Like, how can anybody not watch a Cary Grant movie and be like, this guy is a movie star? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, you better go home. But darling, we were married today. Well, all right, go home, go to bed, get some rest. Rest? Suave. I have not seen any classic movie. Oh, we gotta start some. I, I mean, I haven't seen nearly as much as Tim, but there, there are some, Tim's real, an there are some real good ones. Because I believe he's a vampire <laughs> that's been living for the last, like, 300 years. Because the movies he's seen, I'm like, no person of your generation has he used seen to go that to, many. He used and to go to mean... bars with Cary Grant, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, yes. He's the one that told him to do that thing in that movie before it came out. That was my idea. The photo of the New Year's ball over in the the gold ballroom, me and Cary Grant, 1943. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, hey, Tim, I'm going to be in this new movie coming out. Well, frankly, dear, I don't give a damn. Huh. huh. I, it's, it's a lonely existence because all of these movies that I grew up on and all these movies are like, I love the classics. All the people who appreciate them are slowly disappearing. <laughs> and eventually, unless new people like get into these or unless new people start appreciating them, um, or at least more so, so it becomes commonplace. Like I know there's a ton of people out there that appreciate classic movies, but until it becomes commonplace, like it something that's few and far between as far as like I can sit down and talk with somebody about like oh like I loved uh, Through the Night with uh, Humphrey Bogart or um, any one of that sort like uh, You Can't Take It With You with I think uh, Lionel Barrymore like all these different movies here that if you give it a shot like they're great movies they hold up um, yeah it's funny to think about in like 50 years like maybe sooner but like in just in 50 years, like, the, the pool of people that are talking about movies from the 40s is going to, it's going to get smaller and smaller. Um, it's, I guess it sucks to think about any, like, I guess modern history in the sense of, like, from the late 1800s and onward, like, so much media recorded and created. It's like, people will only have so many time in their lives to give to anything that's ever been made, so. It's going to be weird and, like, honestly 200 years with the way that content is created nowadays i don't know how the fuck you can keep up we're going to be looking at movies from how we look at it from the 80s 200 years from now they're going to feel that way about movies that came out like five years ago <laughs> like wow you remember that one yeah it only came out five years ago but like a thousand other things came out in the same genre since and just the way we consume content then versus now i can only imagine what it's going to be like in the even like recent future yeah opposed to like hundreds of years down well, the line plus it's crazy just to think of as time goes on the things that are now being put into like oh it preservate like i on if you go on like hbo max they have the whole section for i think it's like turner classic movies for the preservation uh films and whatnot for the classics but the cutoff has been moving forward that now all of a sudden the cutoff is like 2001 i check it and it's like oh the turner classic movies Clueless, Turner Classic Movies, Rush Hour, and it's <laughs> yeah. wow. That's bizarre. That's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. How bizarre. Fifty million dollars. And who do you think you kidnapped Chelsea Clinton? 
Oh, as if. So yeah, that that's arsenic and old lace. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> go give it a shot. The classics are worth checking out. I'm always down to talk uh, movies made prior to 1970. I'd or watch post 1970. I'd watch it. Cary Grant. I'd watch any Cary Grant movie. Oh, so many good Cary Grant ones. I mean, North by Northwest. Um, or if you want other comedy the main ones, one like uh, Father Goose is funny. It's him. He's, uh, I think it's during like World War II or something. And he, his job is to be like the radio man on this island by himself. And they drop supplies off every so often. And he's supposed to keep an eye out for, I think, like enemy ships or enemy planes. And then I forget what the si- situation was, but it's like a... Um, like a girl's school or something like that, like a their ship or their plane goes down and they end up shipwrecked on his island with him. So it's like this grizzled Cary Grant that hates people now having to be the uh, like father figure to all of these children plus the teacher. Right. Fun Cary Grant. So check it out. Check, 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 check it out. Some don't really carry on i'm always amazed on how some movies will make me laugh and it's supposed to be a comedy that like you know i watched it as a kid it was funny but to keep it that way i'm always a nervous like uh how much of this actually yeah. you know still has its thing there's some movies from my childhood like as far as comedies that i've chosen not to watch again because i have a very strong suspicion that it's like yeah i probably won't find it funny this time and I'd rather just leave it in my head of like, I enjoyed it at one time rather than, yeah, my last memory of it is not liking it. So that brings us to what? Number two for <laughs> Nicholas? Yeah. This is one that you showed me that I didn't expect to like. And I actually grew to love it beyond imagining. You were getting tattooed. So our tat- your tattoo artist likes to put on horror movies to watch it so that you know just as a background noise kind of thing sparks discussion and today they decided to put on tucker and dale versus evil mm. college kids what am i doing here fell into the water uh dove in and rescued you we'll go find your friends you should relax tucker and dale are on the case what is this place it's just a cabin it doesn't mean they're psycho killers then why don't you go in there and talk to them all right maybe i will I said maybe. (laughs) At the top of my notes. (laughs) Uh, It's about two hillbillies suspected of being killers by like this group of paranoid like college kid. Um, I keep wanting to say teenagers, but they're not. They're just young college kids, like kids in their early 20s and shit. And they're camping. And then things keep happening where the college kids look at it and they think it's Tucker and Dale (laughs) being the evildoers. But it's pure like coincidence. Because these two are like the most likable duo that you would ever want to actually like, share a beer with. And like, oh, these you guys are awesome. Like, I want to hang out with them. But the college kids are terrified because, you know, ghost story, campfire um, things are like bullshitting around the campfire late at night. Like, oh, yeah, it's a hillbilly known to be like some wild killer in the nearby woods. And over the course of the movie, the college kids end up kind of killing themselves in front of the <laughs> hillbillies. But. <laughs> Like, the one scene comes to mind with the wood chipper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. Officer, it has been a doozy of a day. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those movies that did so well that as much as I would love to see a sequel, I feel it's good enough as it is on its own that it just sits comfortably in my head like, yeah, that's a great memory. Yeah, that, that definitely... I need to rewatch it because... Every so often, I'll go back and check it out again, and I I still love that movie. Um, I think it's was it Tyler Labine mm-hmm. and Alan Tudyk. Yes, um, mm-hmm. but the two of them were perfect for it. Like just two guys that just want to like <laughs> fix up the cabin and just be able to go <laughs> fishing and just relax. And uh, I re- what was it when they're at the in the beginning of the movie when they first meet the college kids and it, he's <laughs> trying to work up the nerve to like go talk to the girl or whatever. And Alan Tudyk is they just. It's nice, it's disarming if you just kind of say yeah, something uh... and laugh. Going camping? <laughs> <laughs> I watched this movie, I think I, I... I think I watched it once, and it was just like... I think it was at my, was at my parents' house, and just for whatever reason, it was just like... 
hey mom do you want to watch a movie like and we landed on tucker and dale versus evil i think i just saw the trailer and was like oh it's like it's you know i knew the gist of it and explained it to her and she actually really liked it she has a she has a good sense of humor about stuff um i didn't expect it to be i didn't realize it was going to be so gory but she didn't mind but it was like it it was uh that was my that's my i guess memory of it watching it watching it with my mom but it was it's hilarious it's really well done the the term subvert expectations has been brought up in a very negative context in my life a lot <laughs> lately and star wars joke um but this movie i feel properly does it and walking into it i had no idea what it's about and in just even the way that it kind of eases itself into the plot line like it really isn't about anything it's just you guys wanting to go fishing there is no inherently evil thing that's possessing anybody yeah, or supernatural um yeah i mean like the ending with the other kid there like i think that's just kind of where the you know jumps the shark a little bit but the whole rest of the movie is just purely bad luck <laughs> across the board for everybody because it's not what you expect at every turn, and I like that because you're expecting the two hillbilly types to be the one to like wanting to kill everyone. Like, nope, these are the good guys this time. It's like they took a board meeting, broke down the movie, and they just did the complete opposite of every point that they did. So I loved it. It was a good choice, Tim. Thank you for playing it. I, I love a good horror, comedy. yeah. Like, uh, this would be a movie where I would, you know, if I could orchestrate my fate, I would have like, I'd see the poster. I'd see the who's in it, and it's probably like, okay, this is a comedy of some sort, and then just watch the movie. Like, that would be a perfect, like, I think I'm watching a comedy, but I don't really know what's about, and then that would be great. It just has one of those premises where it's like, the less you know, the better, but I know we've spoiled that if you haven't seen it, but it's still really, regardless, it's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great ride. I mean, I would have skipped it, flat out. Because if it wasn't for Alan Tudyk, this looks like one of those, like, college humor kind of movies. If, like, there's one where it's, like, zombie strippers or something. Something or, like, really broad. Lesbian vampire hunters. Oh, lesbian vampire killers with uh, James Corden. <laughs> yeah. Like, I thought it would just be one of those, like, C, B-level, like, comedies. But then watching it, realizing, like, no, this is this is up there. This surpasses all of them. So, I... I think that's great. And it makes me want to watch it again just because as soon as you mentioned it, all the quotes came to my head and I'm like, ah, I need to rewatch this. It's so quotable. Oh, yeah. So quotable. <laughs> I, I I haven't watched it since that that day or that uh, era that came out. Uh, so I definitely needs a revisit from me. Recommended, even from that one time I saw it. Everybody should watch that. If you... I didn't if you don't mind gory it stuff, time either. Like, it's, it's funny, but it's, it's not scary. But it's, oh yeah, it's extremely, extremely not gory. Scary, not scary gore. Like one scene, the, the the college kids are trying. We need to take the hillbillies out. I'm gonna go up behind him with this spear. <laughs> I'm gonna run up to him, and I'm just gonna impale him with the spear. <laughs> and then he goes to run, and then I guess he trips and falls, misses, and this is when um, I, Alan Tudyk is like throwing wood in a wood chipper. <laughs> So the kid misses Alan Tudyk, and instead he goes right into the wood chipper. It's so brutal. And then he's trying to grab his legs to help get him back out, <laughs> and the other kid shows up to try to help to kill him, and just sees him holding the kid's ankles as he's in the wood chipper. Are you okay? <laughs> a comedy of errors. Uh, yeah. A classic formula applied to a horror genre. <laughs> when I first saw it, like, I didn't get to sit down and see it from start to finish. So I only got, like, half hour or 40 minutes into it. In the very beginning, too, I didn't pay full attention because, you know, I'm hanging out with you and Mike at the time. So I was trying not to just watch a movie while we're all actively chatting. But over the course of the movie, I was starting to be less interested in the conversation. Like, this movie's fucking good. <laughs> Have you guys seen this movie? <laughs> So, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Which means... That means me. Hey, me. Um, this is a classic of the... The Mask. <laughs> yeah, I already said that. all them. his 1994 yeah, hits. 1994 Ace was Ventura it. 2. 
Um, Ace Ventura Jr. No, but I did talk about some movies that are cross sections of this one. Um, this fo- this movie comes from the files of Police Squad, and it is called <laughs> The Naked Gun. Enrico Palazzo. <laughs> the Naked Gun. In this city, there's crime on every street. But one man has seen enough. Oh. He's Lieutenant Frank Drebin. Whatever scum did this, not one man on this force will rest for one minute until he's behind bars. Now let's grab a bite to eat. He's a good cop who's having a bad day. His best friend... Oh. Everyone should have a friend like you. ...is in a coma. As soon as Nordberg is better... He's welcome back at Police Squad. But I wouldn't wait until the last minute to fill out those organ donor cards. By the Zucker, one of the Zucker Brothers movies, yes, who originated Airplane. Um, they did Top, Top Secret as well. That's a, the Val Kilmer one. You know, it's interesting to me that that style of humor worked so well, but then when they started to do it with Scary Movie, it just didn't work. I, th- I think Scary Movie did work. From uh, you know, I mean, from what I remember. Like the first one, yeah. First one was decent, and it just kind of got went progressively. Downhill. Yeah, I will say though that the third movie has one of my favorite I, favorite I jokes. I knew you were gonna bring of this all up. time. <laughs> we we recently, I had never seen the first or any of the scary movies, so um, I don't think those would be up your alley. What did you think? I I didn't love them. There are parts I laughed at, and then when we got to the third movie, as we were making our way through. As soon as the part came up, I remembered it from you telling me about it. And I immediately was like, check this out. This is Dean's favorite line. <laughs> what? What is it? Uh, I seen it only once and I was on a date. I don't remember the movie. So the third one, I think it's it's a uh, main. Uh, I think it's sign. Is it signs? Signs is yeah. like the main parody, like the plot that it parodies. And Charlie yeah. Sheen plays the Mel Gibson priest character. And it's the scene where, from Signs, where his wife's in an accident. Um, you know, she's like being held together by the truck against the tree. Um, yeah. <laughs> in the movie, there's this really serious moment where, like, all the first responders are at the and firefighters are at the scene, and that it just it's it's showing their persp- like a uh, Mel Gibson's perspective, walking to see his wife, and they're just looking at him like, oh man, like I'm, so, it just feels so bad for him. And they do that same shot in the parody. <laughs> and it's like the serious, you know, like everybody's looking at him like, you poor bastard. And then the guy who hit her, he's part of that group and just stands up. And he's like, Tom, I need a ride home. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> like, that just like kills. That's just like a great dark joke. That just like perfect. <laughs> Tom, I'll need a ride home. <laughs> just ignoring the severity of the situation. <laughs> anyway, um, I think they, the Zuckers, did David Zucker come in and on Scary Movie three? I know they maybe it was Scary Movie four they started because it was the the it was the Wayans brothers that were like the cre the you know the creative team behind the first two, and I think the Zucker somebody came in, uh, on the third movie. I I feel like it maybe it was the fourth movie. In any case, yeah, those movies were spawned from Airplane and that that spoof humor that those guys you know invented and perfected um and then the naked gun like leslie nielsen had already been like you know an airplane all those serious actors did their comedic shtick and it's a great you know it's a classic but i think just airplane i saw more as a kid and just resonated more those jokes resonate more with me throughout the whole movie and it's like there's not a bad or unfunny scene in the whole thing as far as i'm concerned like it's just it's it's wacky and it's silly and uh i especially love there's a scene <laughs> leslie nielsen is trying to get information out of this guy at like the docks <laughs> and it's the whole like <laughs> it's the whole routine of like yeah lieutenant drebin police squad oh i remember you drebin uh, well, what do you want i want to ask you some questions you're familiar with that face i don't know My memory ain't so great. Oh, yeah? Maybe this will refresh your memory. I don't know. It's still kind of hazy. How about this? Yeah, I remember him. I used to see him around. Why do you want to know? I can't tell you that. 
Well, maybe this will help. I really don't think I should. Yeah, you still don't think so? All right, his name is Nordberg. He's a cop. The movie's just full of that. I mean, it's like, you've seen Airplane, you've seen those other movies, you know what to expect, but it just... I don't know, it's it's classic, it's like... Even after all these yeah. years, Airplane still makes me laugh, because it's just the the serious nature of whatever situation's presented to them, and just like, I think my favorite line to this day is just like... You'd better tell the captain, we've got to land as soon as we can. This woman has to be gotten to a hospital. A hospital? What is it? It's a big building with patients, but that's not important right now. Tell the captain I must speak to him. <laughs> Pick the wrong week to quit methamphetamine. <laughs> you like movies about gladiators, Joey? <laughs> <laughs> I always love the drinking problem thing, because every time yeah. something spills, whenever I watch someone drink, that's my first thought. I'm like, oh, problem. you got a drinking problem? I love how I, we started this whole topic of... It was difficult for me to find three comedies that would make my list. And now since we've started, I remembered like nine of them that just make me crack up thinking about them. <laughs> and, uh, oh, who's, uh, what's her name? Priscilla Presley is the female love interest in The Naked Gun. <laughs> she climbs up the ladder to like get something out of the attic and he's looking up and he's like, nice beaver. Thank you. I just had it stuffed. Let me help you with that. And she's like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the taxidermy beaver. Or uh, was, surprise, O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Uh, I think was in the first one. As, oh, yeah. Uh, the, and the second one, I think, too. Yeah. Uh, like the partner or whatever it was. Nordberg. And he ends up, Nordberg. And he ends <laughs> up in the hospital and he's like in this full body cast. And the nurse is like uh, telling his wife, I think we can save your husband's arm. Where would you like it sent? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh. Oh yeah, and just and yeah, everything is good when he's the umpire and just <laughs> he's like, yeah, I forget how he gets onto the field in disguise as an umpire, but they throw the first pitch and he's just the catcher catches it and every, it's just like this long moment of silence. Everybody just looks at him, <laughs> waiting for what he says, and he's like, uh, strike. And he gets into it. Just calls everything a strike and is like moonwalking. Oh, God. <laughs> and to it's think of like the time, through. Leslie Nielsen was a dramatic actor. <laughs> right. This movie got him Surf Ninjas. Um, yeah, it really? I don't I mean, uh, just him being Leslie Nielsen. I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> I only knew him as a, like, a comedic actor. Right. From airplane to like all the way up to like Mr. Magoo, that's that's all I know him from. Yeah. I didn't know until years later that no, he was, he was a he was another like Jeff Daniels kind of thing, just in reverse. Yeah, yeah. Like it seemed toward the end, he just did comedies instead of this typical airplane like, yeah. dramas. Yeah, set that path yeah. for him. Um, yeah, yeah, that was everybody. Robert Stack, um, Leslie Nielsen. I don't know what's the oh, and what's the main the other guy. Who can't the wrong week to quit drinking? They were all like, uh, was it they Robert? Were all, they were all serious actors. Um, in any case, um, the Naked Gun. I mean, you could pick pick any clip and just like play it while we're talking. And I will just like, um, Reggie Jackson. It's funny. Reggie Jackson has a big part in this movie. At, at, you know, towards the in that baseball scene, like the 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 climax, and he shows up later. David Zucker directed the basketball with Matt Stone and Trey Parker, and then Reggie Reggie Jackson has a cameo in that movie too. So I guess they stayed friends. <laughs> Reggie, Coop, nice going out there. Thanks, man. But you know, I got to tell you, it's because of you that I'm here. That's nice to know. I brought this for you. I saw some kid try to leave the ballpark with it. You got to hang on to that. I got the two home run balls I hit in the World Series. Some wretched little shit got the third one. That sucks, dude. Ever since, uh, ever since the Naked That's Gun. That's a favor if I ever asked for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what is there to say about the Naked Gun? If you don't find anything about that movie funny, like, I don't want to know you. 
And if you do find it funny, check out the TV show that was short-lived, Police Squad. Oh, yeah. I think I've seen one or two episodes of that. I need to track it's the rest so of good. them down. It is. It is. It's it's great. There is a show with Rashida Jones. Oh, like, oh something. Yes. Tribeca. That, yeah. Angie Tribeca. Yes. I didn't yeah, like that. That had a... Its humor style was very reminiscent of right. this. That's what I heard. I, I still... I hadn't gone to check it out. I only... I only seen one episode of it, and it was a little jarring because you don't expect naked gun airplane humor in a TV show. So when they threw some of the jokes out there, it was like, holy shit, what the fuck is this? And it was kind of hard to watch. But once you kind of <laughs> realize this is what the show is, I think it would be more appreciation for it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it might be up your alley. I remember my father introducing me to Police Squad and getting to the end of the episode where normally there would be like the freeze frame as the credits come up, but everybody would just stand still. So as the credits are going, you see people like <laughs> just kind of wobbling or somebody would be pouring coffee. And as the credits are going, the cup overflows and it's just like pouring and you see it like pouring on his lap. and It's just like everybody's standing still. The best one of those that I remember, because I've seen one or you know, a couple episodes, it's like they have this criminal in handcuffs and they're in a police station and they all freeze frame and he like looks around like <laughs> nobody's moving and he just gets up and like runs out of the I don't remember if it was Police Squad or one of the Naked Gun movies but um, they like find Leslie Nielsen in his office or something like that and he's like you and how did you get in here? I'm a locksmith and I'm a locksmith <laughs> that was <laughs> that was Police Squad yeah yeah <laughs> I'm a locksmith and I'm a locksmith Oh god. Uh I can I go on watch. all night about yeah. Naked Gun and Police Squad. <laughs> yeah. So that brings me to number one, which to me I feel is a film that is perfectly cast, perfectly made, and I would not change a single thing about it. It is nineteen eighty five, based on a board game, Clue. Every person in this room has the perfect motive. Stand back! For murder. What do you mean? Murder. But only one of these suspects is the murderer. Is it the timid Mr. Green? Ah! Why are you screaming? Because I'm right out one! Screaming! Or the militant Colonel Mustard? Oh, if I was the killer, I would kill you next. Huh? Set him. Yeah. Mrs. White, who helped Damn. her husband on his way. What's well, a matter of life after death? Uh, so, directed by Jonathan Lynn, who did Sergeant Bilko, uh, My Cousin Vinny, The Whole Nine Yards. Um, so, like, every, everybody should know this movie, and if not, like, definitely go check it out. It, As I said, like, it's the absolute perfect cast. The script does not miss a beat for 97 minutes. I remember seeing this on Comedy Central as a kid, and most of the rapid-fire jokes went over my head. But the ones I did get were enough to make this a favorite, especially everything with Tim Curry. Like, uh, when I think it was like the cop shows up at the door and they think that he found out that uh, there was a body in the other room. And he's like, wait, so there's no problem? Yeah, it's a free country. Don't you know that? I didn't know it was that free. (laughs) (laughs) But for a movie that entirely occurs within like a single location, it somehow never gets stale and there's never a scene that drags. Uh, but yeah, like anybody that's never seen Clue, do yourself a favor and go check out Clue. It's timeless. Oh, yeah. I didn't watch it until I think I was like 23, 24. And you wouldn't have known that it was made in, you know, 20 years ago at that point. Yeah. Some movies from like the 80s and stuff, you can definitely feel like it's dated. It's still funny, but it has that older kind of comedy style to it. This I felt. Like, it could have been made last year. I wouldn't have known the difference. Kind of like what they did with, like, American Psycho and make it look like it was shot in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, if you could have done that with Clue, you wouldn't have known. This is another one of those... uh, I I watched Comedy Central a lot when I was... uh, I say a kid, but I guess, like, teenager, you know. Um, Back when they used to run these, these classic movies all the time. Um, I don't think I ever caught this outside of a TV edit or like, you know, broken up by commercials. I never sat down and straight just watched it uninterrupted. Yeah, because I, like I don't do think that. there was anything TV edit wise that they had to change or take out. So it was literally just right. a case of the straight movie just thrown in with commercials. Wouldn't it have been like the ending? 
Because then they have like three or four different the, endings the, that the the home release had them all. Yeah, and I think the, I think the, the last card ending that pops up and it's like yeah. it could have happened this way. Dun, 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 right. dun, 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 I think they do make a hard decision for the home release, right? They say this is how yeah, it really but it ended. really happened this way, right? Where X is the killer. Um, yeah. <laughs> which are you probably going to go into that the theatrical way they did it? Yeah, so like I I loved how they had three different endings that I guess originally like I, I granted I wasn't around to see it in theaters, but depending on the theater, they had a different ending to the movie, seeing as it was based on a board game, like it could go anyway. And then the one that I originally saw was the the home version that had all three different versions. So it's like here's how it could have happened, or it could have been this person is the killer and this is how it could have happened, or this is how it really happened. Um, and every time it, it's, it changes a little bit from there, but it's, I actually almost prefer one of the endings that turned out to not be the actual ending because I was always rooting for a, a different person, um, <laughs> who turns out to be the bad guy, but I, I mean, I just, I don't think we've seen that happen since. And it's probably might've been the first one to like, imagine going see a movie and you go to talk about it with somebody who also saw it and you're like, what are you talking about? That wasn't. He wasn't the killer. Like, this was the. They were the killer. Like, and just going and like you saw a completely different ending. Conversations and like buzz that would have generated. I don't know. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, that whole thing is pretty bold when you think about it. Because yeah. in the eighties, to make a movie based on a board game, even today, it's like very hit or miss. You didn't like Battleship. <laughs> <laughs> You sank my <laughs> battleship. So for them to do that in the 80s, and not only that, but shoot like three or four different endings, like that's fucking bold. I mean, they had a huge classic on their hands, but did they know when they were making that? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, like they had a, a all-star cast. I mean, you had like Tim Curry, Martin Mull, Christopher Lloyd, Eileen Brennan. It was a the solid cast that they had to have known. Like these are all great like comedic actors and whatnot, so it, it has to turn out good. It was fun. They had all the little like kind of uh, music icons in the movie. Mister Body was uh, I think leaving from the Germs. What the like singing Telegram Girl was Jane Weedlin from the Go Go's. So it was all these fun little cameos and whatnot. But I think every single character was perfectly cast in this, and it has I one of my favorite me. closing lines in this movie. Okay, Chief, take him away. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. And then it's just the friends. <laughs> <laughs> I know my wife, uh, Laura, who, if you listen to the Power Rangers episode, was a guest. She she might put Clue on her list. Like, she loves that movie. Oh, that yeah. That might be in her top three. Like, I, I remember us chatting Clue, like, years ago. So it's been like an ongoing thing for ages. Yeah, she loves it. Seems we're fossils. <laughs> so yeah, Clue. Play the board game, then uh, watch the film. Or just watch the then film. Then play the board game. <laughs> for the source material. Then watch the what film. What are the few murder mystery movies, too, that actually, I think, work? Because you really have no idea yeah. who did it. And just the way that it was written so that they did have multiple endings, they knew as they were writing it, like, let's not make things too obvious. And if we are going to make something obvious, throw the whole thing, uh, you know, upside down so that, hey, it definitely could be Professor Plum. Oh, shit, it actually could be this yeah, person Yeah, because it's like now. each of those endings are all plausible. So it's not just, oh, it's so-and-so with no backing evidence. They actually run through the whole thing, which is fun. If Anybody likes yep. the kind of the comedy whodunit kind of deal of everybody in a house. Uh, another one is called Murder by Death with Peter Falk, which is, uh, I haven't seen it in many years, so I don't know if it holds up, it but it was from prior to Clue. But the whole thing is all these different parodies of famous detectives all in this house trying to solve a murder together. Yeah, I think I saw that. I might have watched that in film school. Like, <laughs> it might have been one of the subjects for one of the classes um or something i don't know i remember watching that but i can't remember much about it at this point but i i i don't think i've seen a lot of whodunit kind of movies but i did i would just say i really enjoyed knives out ryan johnson is it ryan or ryan ryan yeah i just feel like he spells it yeah ryan 
It's the subvert expectation. <laughs> this whole, this whole shit. I won't go into that here. Yeah. One day I'll get my Star Wars episode, but it is not this episode. I might have, this might, I don't know if this is true or not, but I thought I heard that they were going to make another uh, Knives Out, like Knives just out. centered around or featuring uh, Daniel Craig's Southern Foghorn Lakehorn. character. Yeah, it's extremely <laughs> Foghorn I think so. But I, I, He's been busy with stuff, so I think it's just a matter right. of planning. And I mean, I guess just to say that I really enjoyed Knives Out. I would love to watch more of those, uh, if you know, if they're well written. Like, a, I'm like, bring on the Who Done It. Yeah, I feel like especially, there's not a lot of fun like mysteries. That. Like, if right. they do, it's like a, a murder thing. Like, a, was it like Girl on the Train or like Gone Girl? And it's like, okay, they're good, but give me like an actual mystery, mystery that's fun, like Knives Out. Yeah. Knives Out was ruined for me because of um, the way Apple deals with its product placement. Oh, that what is it? The a villain can't use Apple. Villains don't use. Yeah, villains aren't allowed to use Apple products. So when you have the whole <laughs> cast using Android or nondescript phones, and then that one per, or he's the only one out of a whole cast using iPhones to be the one using a nondescript phone, I immediately knew. Like, um, my niece told up. me about that, and I hadn't gone to like try to analyze or like check the uh veracity veracity is that the word i want the uh yeah truthfulness to that but it it makes it sadly makes sense and now it's like i kind of forgot about it i hope i forget about it again because then i'll be looking at i'll be looking at movies um so yeah that's clue so i'm gonna go home and sleep with my wife onto your pick so I had a couple of honorable mentions that I was kind of throwing together and I wasn't sure if I wanted to speak on for them instead of my actual third pick. But judging by the way this is going, I would be remiss if I didn't mention at least one of these classic movies that this man uh, unfortunately left us too early with, and that is Mrs. Doubtfire. Hello. Mrs. Hillard, I presume? Yes. I'm Miranda Hillard. Euphigenia Doubtfire. Yes. Won't you please come in? Hello! We need at least one Robin Williams movie in this list, and I feel Mrs. Doubtfire should be that one. So it follows a man that ends up getting a divorce with his wife, and he is an absolute, like, he loves his kids, and he will go through any length. I remember seeing, like, a YouTube video where, like, they recut Mrs. Doubtfire to be, like, oh. like a serial killer movie. <laughs> And I was just thinking that as I'm like reciting the plot line to the movie, but he loves his kids and he refuses to kind of listen to the guidelines of what the child services said that, you know, you're only allowed to see your kids on the weekends, like every other week. And that's it. And he absolutely hated that kind of um, judgment that was placed on him. And he is a good person, kind of messy, but like his heart is in the right places for that. So what he ends up doing is he knows his wife needs a babysitter and he pretty much blackouts the entire interview process so that he is the only option that she has. And he kind of lines himself up so that he was the perfect choice. And he decides to go disguised as an old English woman to be the perfect nanny for his wife, or now ex-wife, and his kids while she's at work. Euphigenia Doubtfire, dear. I specialize in the education and entertainment of children. Surprise! <laughs> Him trying to do the double life of living as the old woman and then as himself, trying to make sure that, you know, he's able to stay in that line of um, pleasing the caretaker and making sure that they see that, you know, he is evolving as a person and he's not just living as like a bum in an apartment that he's trying to show that I can watch my kids look at this. I got a job. I have a clean apartment, so on and so forth. But then also trying to stay up to date with his kids and uh, um, compete against his uh, replacement boyfriend who happens to be a Pierce Brosnan <laughs> James Bond at the time it was definitely a fun thing <laughs> watching him interact with each other and I the, the two big moments like I don't remember a whole lot of this movie I know I saw it like back at the time but the two big moments yeah that stick out for me is when he doesn't have his makeup on and sticks his face in the pie <laughs> yeah <laughs> Miss Hillard? The water's boiling. Hello! And then later on, I think they're at the pool, 
and he just just pegs <laughs> Pierce Brosnan in the back of the head with an orange, like just. You're in my life right now, thanks, Todd. Oh, what about their real father? Yeah. What can I say, Ron? The guy's a loser. I'll see you. Loser. Yeah. Oh, sir, I saw it. Some angry member of the kitchen staff. Did you not tip them? Oh, the terrorists, they ran that way. It was a run by fruiting. I'll get them. Don't worry. <laughs> does he... Does Pierce look and, like, does she play it off like it was, like, a kid or something? Like, she didn't do it? Yeah, because he says some, like, backhanded thing about himself, like, the ex-husband. Like, yeah, I guess he was just some, like, slacker or something that just wasn't worth his kids and that triggers yeah. him so that as he walk turns around and walks away he just grabs a piece of fruit and throws it at him like a fucking asshole and then when he turns around it's like oh it must have been a kid it's right by fruit <laughs> so like when he's, he's talking about what was like the did he pass on eight years ago dear this november what happened he was quite fond of the drink ah it was a drink that killed him how awful. He was an alcoholic. No, he was hit by a Guinness truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Robin Williams for being like an absolute legend. I feel like a majority of his movies were mostly dramatic roles. So it was tossed between like all of his stand up and all of his other comedy. And then probably like, I feel like 65% of all of his movies were all these like dramatic things, at least until like. Later on in his life, I feel like there was a lot of comedy roles that uh, came out. But for the most part, it's like, for years, it was... Actually, I mean, there's always something peppered in, in there. Because it's like, he might end up doing uh, Dead Poet Society and doing, like, The Fisher King and doing all of that. And then you might end up with, like, a... Um, uh, what was the movie? Uh, the Birdcage. That was really good. That was kind of a, a fun one in between. I remember in the movie, uh, like... It, I was recently showing somebody to Wong Fu, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar, uh, about Patrick Swayze, Wesley Snipes, and John Leguizamo, who are three drag queens who are headed out to like this competition, and they're driving by car, and like the car breaks down, they end up in this small town, um, and they learn to accept them, and it's great. Um, but <laughs> I never noticed there's a cameo in the beginning where they have to go to this bar to like get the help of some guy that they know. John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, and then Robin Williams sits down, and I never knew he was in the movie because for some reason I always missed it. And they're like, And Noxima, you remember John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt? Oh, yes. His name is my name, too. Do people always shout, I hate that? Ooh, yeah. Look at you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is so missed. Yeah, he's. We were all together when we found out yeah. he passed. I don't recall that. Well, I cherish our memories, too, Dean. Thanks. Yeah. I just remember the good one. Um, I can't remember anything. So, yeah. This is Doubtfire. A classic. Is it dishonest for him to disguise himself to get back into the life of his ex-wife? Maybe. Does that age well? Probably not. Is the movie still fun? Yes. Much like Nick would be remiss if he didn't bring up Robin Williams, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up some humor from across the pond. Uh, this movie is The Office the Movie by Ricky Gervais. No, that doesn't exist, does it? No, not that no. I know of. Yeah. Um, you're familiar with comedy groups, British comedy Never groups. Never heard of them. You can see where I'm going with this. Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Once in a lifetime, there comes a motion picture which changes the whole history of motion pictures. A picture so stunning in its effect, so vast in its impact, that it profoundly affects the lives of all who see it. One such film is... Very good, thank you. Yes, thank you. Next, please. Once in a lifetime, there comes a motion picture which changes the whole history of motion pictures. Uh, yes, thank you. Next. Uh, 
that took longer for it to land on my in my head than it should have. <laughs> I I That's didn't okay. see it up until this year. I just saw it for the first time like five months ago. I should rewatch it because I feel like it stands the test of time. But I when I I I feel I would get crucified for saying it, but I did not like it on my first wa- like watch. But I was like fifteen, sixteen at the time. That's why, and I was not in the right mindset of watching it. Oh, because I think it's too I could see that adult and humor for me to fully appreciate. Because some of the joke, like clips and stuff that I watch now, like makes me laugh, and I forget like all that comes from Monty Python, like the Holy Grail. Like the thing was like, um, what like your mother smells of elderberries, and I fought in your general direction. That's from <laughs> that, right? Yeah, yeah, like that's fucking classic. I love that, or like the whole like horse, um, yeah, coconut gag. Yeah, which I, I believe I believe comes from budgetary oh, reasons. They're like we can't afford up, horses, but up. here's this funny way to do it. Hey man, like, it's using the same coconuts way, like, is like a radio trope for horses, and it's like yeah. it works. It's the same way that like oh well, yeah. the Jaws shark didn't work, so we'll just put him in less right. clips, and that worked out to their advantage. Yeah, same thing yeah. with this. Happy like act. I think it's fucking comedy gold. Yeah, I I saw that. See, I saw this. I'm I'm pretty sure I was a freshman. Or sophomore in high school. No, a freshman, because I referenced this movie in the first, like, quote-unquote, movie I ever made, which was a, an English class assignment. Um, we had, we you know, made a video. I essentially was the director, I guess, but we all, it was a collaborative thing. But anyway, I referenced this movie, and that was ninth grade. So I was, like, 13 or 14 when I saw this. And, like, yeah, I, I loved the shit out of it. Like, uh... This became just my like comedy movie that I just look back on and yeah, it probably helped shape a lot of I mean Ace Ventura shaped the early years, but as I was maturing, quote unquote, um Monty Python and the Holy Grail just like it's so fucking silly. And I mean that's just Monty Python, but um yeah, it really hit me in the right way at that age. And like just like a formative like, I could probably do a screen... I mean, I don't think it's a great subject for screen refresh, but, like, it, it was that kind of movie where it was like, yeah, that's the movie that made me develop. I actually thought you were going to say comedy. Mr. Bean at first. Because <laughs> he's another, that's, like... That's actually a funny movie. I haven't seen that in a long time, but that yeah. that's great. <laughs> Bean is a great... Like, the, the American, like, Bean movie from the 90s is really funny. With Peter, with Peter McNichol, you yeah. know. Yeah, and it's just a like a combination of all of the different like skits that he's done right from his show and they just threw it yeah. in a movie which works. Yeah. But still, like I always I grew up with him and I thought you were going to say him at first, but I'm like no, <laughs> it definitely wouldn't be that. He deserves, you know, he's in the comedy pantheon for sure. Mhm. I was hesitant to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail for the first time because I've never been a huge fan of the show just because I feel like it was it's a little kind of zany and surreal that doesn't quite land with me. Like I, I like British, like I, I like British comedy. Like I, I grew up watching like, are you being served and all that kind of stuff, but it's not really typical British comedy. So it didn't always land with me, but watching this, not everything did, but I laughed at a majority of it. And it's a case of like, it, it's obviously it's a classic for a reason. <laughs> I just thought of like the side, the whole like sea story going on of like the uh, the narrator that gets murdered oh. by one of the knights. <laughs> just the, how that culminates at the end of the movie. Yeah, this just has there's some. It's like endlessly quotable for me. Kind of like that, probably more so than the Naked Gun for me. Just um, just the silliness and like even like the small jokes. Like one of my favorites, just one lines from the movie is. Uh, when af- it's the scene uh, at the castle in the swamps where Lancelot comes and like murders everybody, think- thinking he's saving a damsel in distress. <laughs> but before that, be like the weak little prince and his father <laughs> standing at the window, and he's like, "Oh, this will be yours." What the curtain? Because he's like gesturing toward the window. What father, the window. <laughs> <laughs> what the curtains? No, not the curtains. <laughs> and he's like. Obvi- I mean, it it that develop it progresses. It like you see, like oh, he's gay, and he's like, um, and he doesn't want to get married because he's it's a woman, and it's, uh, but 
Don't want to get married. Don't like her. What's wrong with her? She's rich. She's got huge tracts of land. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's... There's so many good moments. Uh, oh, when Arthur's, like, first trying to gather, like, knights, he's, like, riding through the countryside to the peasants. And he explains to them, he's like, I didn't... Why are you king? He's like, I, di I didn't vote for you. <laughs> he's like... Yeah, the amount of lines I don't realize come from this, I should appreciate the movie a lot more. Because I know I've used a GIF version of every single one of your quotes several times over oh, the last what was year. The... How'd you become king? Uh, well, the Lady of the Lake held aloft from the bosom of the water, Excalibur. <laughs> like, listen, strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is not a basis for a system of government. <laughs> I just, yeah. Yeah, that'll always be my, probably be my top. It's like one of those, like, you find that movie that's like your number one, and it's like, even though if you find, you laugh and laugh at other movies, like, it probably will never be unseated as my top, just because of the impact it had. And it's a classic. Comedies are tough nowadays, I feel, because a lot of them just, they make me, like, breathe harder through my nose. They don't, like, <laughs> and that, that's really the most that they'll get out of me. It's rare that I'll ever get, like, I'm dying because I'm laughing because I yeah. can't breathe. <laughs> it's I'm more amused than anything else. Yeah. Like it's few and far between. Like other than Scare Package, I don't think there's been a movie I've seen in the past couple years that I've laughed at. There's been some shows that I've found yeah. that I like, but I mean we'll get to those someday. Yeah, I think that comes more from TV for me now. Those gut busting laughs. I think people like people who like Monty Python are maybe more. Not pretentious people, but, you know, they'll, they'll say, they'll look at um <laughs> The Life of Brian and say that is the better, like, movie, just with the themes and, like, just, I guess all around, like, going on, but, and I love Life of Brian, it's a great, it's a great movie, but I just, I just really, I enjoyed uh, The Holy Grail more, more as, as a comedy. It's all about what resonates with you, because a lot of, like, I was trying to think of, like, favorite skits from the actual show. And, um, like, the upper-class twit of the year, I never actually laughed at. But watching the segment, always, like, I was completely fixated. Because, yeah, it's not making me laugh, but just it amused me greatly watching all of these guys try to, like, do basic things. And they just can't even... They can't, they even can't shoot themselves. They can't yeah. even. Um, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Brave Sir Robin ran away. That's what I almost <laughs> sang earlier during the preamble. I was like, oh, I'll give away one of my picks if I sing that song. <laughs> when danger reared its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail and fled. I would have just written it off as I just didn't. Dean, Dean, Dean. I never would have connected the dots. <laughs> yeah. His heart, rot up, heart ripped out and his eyeballs crushed. <laughs> and his penis. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is Monty Python and the Holy Grail, a little-known comedy gem. From a little, not very widely known group. Yeah, from this unknown list that includes Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, and whatever Dean's second pick was. The Naked, the naked Gun. Who's <laughs> a pretentious one now? These, these independent uh, <laughs> comedy films that never went anywhere. Oh, I'm sorry, is this podcast the Find the Obscure Comedy podcast? It is. <laughs> sorry if my recent release does not equate to Arsenic and Lace from the 1900s. <laughs> oh, all your movies were from the 1900s. <laughs> Tucker and Dale wasn't. Okay, fine. Gotcha. A majority. Got ya. Got him. <laughs> so, does anybody have any honorable mentions that they haven't honorably mentioned? I, pr I probably already time. did in all the uh, sides. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. The, the the pest was definitely one oh, of yeah, them. Oh yeah, that's right. You brought that up. Um, I love John Leguizamo, especially his early career. Like after, um, the Mario Brothers. As much of that was a disappointment, I still enjoyed the movie and I wanted to see more of him. But he's too of an adult actor for a young child to watch. So the pest, I think, was one of the few things that I was able to see. That would have been up my alley. Because I know, I think around the time, too, he was in Romeo and Juliet. And that just did not resonate with the <laughs> eight-year-old self that I was at the time. Eight or ten. Just definitely not He was good me. in that, though. Especially, yeah. 
And it was a modern yeah. take, too. I think too, it was Bosler who did that. Yep. Uh, yep. But I, I really like the pest, and it's still funny to me. It's just some lines I The most dangerous game I mentioned it earlier. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, another one, Dean, you might have seen it since it's up your uh, it's your forte. Ready to Rumble? I did see it at David the time. Arquette. Yeah, with um, Oliver yeah. Platt and... Uh, Yep. Yes. And is it Scott Kahn is the other guy too? Yeah. Yeah. I think. I'm not even a wrestling guy, but that's like that is um like one of my cult classic favorite wow. movies of all time. I love this movie to death and I know nothing about the source material from just what's given to me. So like some of the characters like Sting, Diamond Dallas Page, I do recognize them as professional wrestlers. That's as far as it goes. I will rule you. It's funny to think of him as a wrestler like Oliver Platt. Yeah, he was in the ring. I guess they just write his character like that. That's a movie I I saw, remember enjoying, but just haven't revisited. You know, it's one of those, some, like Tim was saying about just not picking on the wedding crashers, but it's like, oh yeah, I haven't like seen that. And like, I liked it at the time, but yeah, I haven't seen that in a while. I still think it holds up. It's some little dated things here and there, but I mean, at this point, as dated as anything from the 80s, so... I mean, I I guess it might go in line with what you were saying before, that with the sheer amount of things coming out now, and especially with having greater access to all of these things getting released, that it could hold up. It could still be a, a funny movie, but because we have so many options now and so many things that it can't just be a good movie. It has to be like an amazing movie to be worthwhile to take time to go back and check it out again. Seen as by in the time that I do that, it's like, Oh, well a hundred new movies came out and I already used up my time kind of deal. So. Right. Analysis paralysis. We have too many things to, um, in the vein of, I guess my, Oh, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't even, Never mind. I'm not going to say this. Don't cut it out. But, there's a movie, maybe if you haven't heard of it, I won't say anything further, but it came out this year, a couple months ago. It's called Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. Have you heard of this movie? Oh, is that the one where there's the, the child with, what is it, the submarine? And he has yes. his hands on the steering wheel and they're like, yep, that's it. Did, did Quick you see little this? movements. Did, did you see that movie? No, you told us this story during the Silver Bullet episode. I told you that about it? <laughs> Oh shit! God damn it! Now cut this out. <laughs> nope, um, leave it in. Oh, did I, tell, did I did I just tell you to watch that movie so I didn't see? Yeah, because that's what I was gonna do just now. Yeah, you you told us about that scene specifically when we were discussing yeah. uh, people driving in movies. <laughs> right, right. Yes, lots of little left to right hand movement. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I would to the listeners and to you guys. Um, I don't want to say too much, but I would say just give it a shot. If you don't like it in the first 20, you're probably 10 to 20, you're probably not going to enjoy it. But it wasn't, I'll say, just say it wasn't what I expected it was going to be. I didn't know anything about it going in. I was like, I did not know this was going to be this kind of movie. And that's, I need to start that's even doing saying that. too much, but you should start with this movie. You, you might, maybe, maybe you don't like it, but. I've been so jaded in the last couple of years when it comes to recommendations from people. Like, you should watch this movie. I don't. <laughs> There's not a lot that actually even sparks interest anymore unless it's in my own personal niche of just like, I'm going to watch this because I know I'm going to like it kind of thing. And a lot of the times it's just, I'll watch the trailer and it's just like, I can kind of already piece together what the whole movie's going to be like and I have movie no interest roulette. in seeing it. Don't watch a trailer, don't even read a synopsis. Yeah, let- you know, just put it on and start watching. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned before is, because I like horror movies, on the Shutter Network... Every day when I get up to start work, I just pull it up on my browser. And then whatever is like the recently added, I'll start from like whatever the the newest of the recently added. And I'll just click it, click play, just start watching it, not read anything about it. And granted, not all of them have been amazing, but I found a lot of fun stuff that it's like, oh, well, that's a surprise. I guess this is a vampire movie. It's things like that that it it adds a little bit of the excitement to movie watching again because as you said, like with the advent yeah. of all the changes to trailers and whatnot, that 
you watch a trailer, you've ruined the movie for yourself. I know <laughs> Netflix has like a random feature, but I don't know. Does it actually show what? No, I think if you do the shuffle play now, it just like starts a movie. It immediately starts. It doesn't even give you the the stupid nope, I title think it card. Just starts. It might pop it up in the upper left corner, the name of the movie. Um, yeah. So you would just have to hit shuffle and look away. Like uh, Indiana Jones. Oh, what a coincidence. Yeah, the Little Rascals is on here. What a coincidence. They're all Netflix originals. <laughs> Lily Hammer, 48 times. <laughs> Six Underground. <laughs> I My favorite thing is I took a screenshot of something I was watching on Netflix one time. And I think it was like Love Actually. And then it was like, if you liked Love Actually, you might like. And the recommendations at the bottom was like, when Harry met Sally, serendipity, dead silence. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, if, if I liked Love Actually, I might like the James Wan evil puppet movie. Pu- puppet yeah. movie? <laughs> <laughs> Where the woman comes back from the dead to take people's tongues. That happened to me once. I think it's like, oh, you watched You've Got Mail. Can we recommend Top Gun? Like, I don't know if it's a case of... <laughs> That, it's like, wow, closer. this is really weird. <laughs> or it's just, do they just know me that well? Because I saw it, I'm like, yeah, I like both of these movies. <laughs> There's a correlation. Is your algorithm off, or <laughs> is it just, like, really on? <laughs> so, my honorable yeah. mentions. Um, I only had two. Young Frankenstein. My favorite Mel Brooks movie. Oh, yeah. Absolute classic. It's... Frankenstein. 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 Young Frankenstein. It's the one that my family quotes all the time. Like when somebody's leaving, it's like, wait, I was going to make espresso. It's all of these different quotes from the uh, <laughs> the movie that are just great. Like the Val Blucher thing and um, walk this way. And it's anybody that hasn't seen. What? what knock? Knock? <laughs> oh, thank you, doctor. Anybody that hasn't seen it's Young been a Frankenstein, shame. check it out. It's a shame. I was going to say, that's probably the Mel Brooks movie I've probably seen the least. Like, maybe just a tw- two or th- maybe two times. And, I mean, I love it. But, like, damn, like, that's that's one of the ones I should watch more. Yeah. Check I mean, it it's again. A, after seeing that movie, I can never hear Putting on the Ritz without doing the... <laughs> Put it on the Ritz! <laughs> 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 Oh, sweet mystery of love. No, so the the whole thing, for anybody that doesn't know, is it's uh, it's like Frankenstein's descendant uh, going back to the castle and getting reintroduced to all of the, like Igor and all of the people that his, uh, I think it was like his grandfather or something new or father knew, um, and recreating Frankenstein's monster played by Peter Boyle. So it, it's... If you like Mel Brooks, it's a riot. Who is the woman uh, that Terry helped Gar him? from Mr. Mom. No, what? Inga. What was uh, her name? Um, was it Inga? It might have been Inga. Her movie name or real name? Uh, yeah, movie I think, name. I want to say it was Inga. I might be wrong. I've been wrong in the past. No, the other woman. Oh, um, Val Blucher? Madeline Kahn is amazing in this movie. Gene Wilder is at like an all time best in this movie. It, it's just, it, it still holds up. Go check it out. It, it, there's so many good things from this movie. Um, I love when he's, no matter what I say, no matter what you hear, you do not open this door. And then he starts getting attacked. <laughs> open the door. Open this door. Oh, dear God, open this door. <laughs> it was a joke. Can't you people take a joke? Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> so, little known film. Name a better duo, Brooks and Wilder. Uh, I think that trailer was on the Spaceballs VHS tape that I had. Because I never watched Young Frankenstein until I was a lot older, but I remember all of those scenes from the trailer. Well, I've only ever seen the trailer, so that's why those are all the parts I quoted. <laughs> so, other than Young Frankenstein, the only other movie out of my list was a... Uh, film by Stephen Chow called Shaolin Soccer, which if oh shit you, yeah I had that, I had that yeah movie. if you ever saw um, like Kung Fu Hustle same guy um, I think he did one more recently The Mermaid that I haven't seen yet but like I've seen bits and pieces and it, it still makes me laugh but Shaolin Soccer is the from like I think it was like two thousand one it's 
um, a guy ends up having like this amazing martial arts ability that he applies to soccer and he ends up reigniting the soccer power within like these old players and they form a team and it, it's it's just wacky and it's hilarious and I still like I've been meaning to rewatch it because I haven't seen it in years but I feel like it would still hold up um, there's like the goalie that's dressed in the Bruce Lee game of death yellow jumpsuit that does all the <laughs> like the Bruce Lee things um, <laughs> I, like I will still always laugh when it's a spoiler but at the end of the movie they win their last game uh, he does a soccer kick that is strong enough to the point where it sets on fire, causes like this tornado, and the enemy goalie tries to block it, and it just tears his entire outfit right off him. And this guy is like butt naked, just getting taken up into a tornado and thrown on into, into the distance. <laughs> I remember Kung Fu Hustle. I think I saw that movie a lot more than I did Challenge Soccer. Yeah. Um, that still holds. Yeah, up. I think Kung Fu. I watched that a couple. Kung years Fu ago. Hustle literally has like cartoon moments. Like it's not literally. Sorry, but yeah, with like the landlady <laughs> and her husband. Yeah, yeah. it's terrific. He, like slapstick. He was good at that. Like yes, he's really good at that brand. Uh, I don't know if I would say he invented. I mean, he has a, a unique style that it's like that's that was pretty good at the time. I haven't seen anything outside of those two movies. So recently, I don't know what. Yeah, Mister Chow has been doing. He's done a ton, and it's he has such a unique style that it's like if you're watching it, you can immediately tell like, oh, okay, this is one of his movies. Okay. But yeah, like it's yeah. it's a blast. Like it's definitely worth checking out. Kung Fu Hustle and Shaolin Soccer. I haven't watched too many of his other things. Those are the two that always kind of came to mind. But I'm I want to watch some more of his stuff because it's these two always stuck out to me. Um, I love in Kung Fu Hustle when he's looking into the crowd and he's trying to pick the fight and he, everybody he points to and he's like, you there, tiny. And then everybody parts and the guy stands up and he's like eight feet tall. And he's like, never mind, sit back down. Yeah, that's a, you. And he that's points to the little kid moment. and the little kid like takes his shirt off and he's like jacked and he's like, oh. He's like ripped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great uh, moment. So Maybe comedy above all else is like, man, I gotta choose fucking three to put on this list? Like, I mean, it's not a finite... I know. Like, this is my favorite just, comedy of all time. I mean, Fight me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, well, at least one of them should be right. Come on. I don't believe in lists. <laughs> like top three lists, like so subjective because I don't know. Like these are just really good comedies that I can think of. And these are three and yeah, it's like top order. three to me at this moment in time. Ask me next week. It could be a different <laughs> yeah. three. Nope. Well, it's because Nick and I change and grow as people as we get older, Dean. Oh, okay. I live in You're the You're frozen in amber. Yeah. <laughs> Much like Jurassic I Park. I see what you did there. Dean, I fought in your general direction. <laughs> is at this point, just west. <laughs> so, yeah. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries. So, yeah, I think we've at this point established that we find a lot more things funny than I originally thought when we came up with this topic and comedy is something that we'll revisit over time and maybe we'll grow and change or we'll still laugh. Uh, so, okay, gang, that wraps up another episode of rule of thirds. We'd like to thank you for coming along for the ride and discussing our favorite comedies. As always, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at screen refresh, or shoot an email to screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three would be, or if you have any topics you want to hear us discuss. That's it from us. So for Nick and Dean, this is Tim. Have a great week, and catch us next on Screen Refresh, the first Monday of the month. Listen, <laughs> a five-ounce bird cannot carry a one-pound coconut. Um, <laughs> I think that was on my SAT. Where'd you get the coconuts? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you found them in Mercia. Coconuts are tropical. Um, <laughs> you can do the whole movie, just, can't that's you? That's a great... I love that. It's a great opening scene and just like he's trying to have this conversation. The guy's hung up. I'm like, where did you get these coconuts? <laughs>
the accent nails it. <laughs> How'd you get the coconut? Um, it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> I just nicked just laying there. <laughs> Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Bring out your dead. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. You got it. You got it. Oh yeah, I'm I'm talking. <laughs> Roll the movie. <laughs>